Okay, welcome everyone to Covenant City Church. Uh, it's a joy to be able to worship with you all here today. If this is your first time here, or if you're newer to CCC, my name is Tazar, one of the elders here at, at CCC. And I look forward to this time, as I do every Sunday, to be able to worship God together with his people. Uh, so if you're new here, what we do at CCC is that oftentimes we, well, all the time, we invite you to stand up and sit down and read out loud different Bible verses and statement of faith and pray together. And the order will, will be all in your liturgy or in the screen behind me. And we do that because we do want to encourage everyone who's here to participate in the act of worshiping God and for it to not just be done by people who are on, on the stage. So uh, let's do that today. Let's join in one voice. Let's worship our God who deserves it. And we pray that at the same time, he realigns our hearts so that we are reminded uh, every Sunday of, of why it is we're here. All right, pray with me. And then I'll invite us to read out loud our call to worship today from 1 Peter chapter 2 can be found in your printouts and also on the screen behind me. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that not only has the gospel been accomplished for us on that cross, that we are now clean, that we are now worthy to come before you, not based upon what we've done this week, not based upon how good we feel about ourselves today, but based purely on what Christ has done for sinners like us on that cross. And we thank you that not only is that accomplished, but it's constantly being applied to us, Father, through your spirit. And he does that through these means of grace. One of them is as we come in worship today as a community and um, really uh, as one body, praise the fountainhead who is Christ. And as we do so, Father, I pray that you would help your church continue to grow up into maturity, that you would help your church um, represent Christ in the way that none of us do right now, slowly, day by day. And as we do so, Father, beyond all of these pragmatic results of what worship could bring, first and foremost, we ask that you be pleased with what we do today, that our act of praise today would be actually a pleasing aroma for you, and that you would bask in the glory that you have purchased on that cross when your son died for the forgiveness of our sins. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Friends, I invite us to stand. And let's read out loud together our call to worship today, taken from 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 1 to 6. Let's read with one voice. So put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. Like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk that by it you may grow up into salvation. If indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in scripture, behold, I'm laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. worship together my God is slow to anger when I go astray bless the Lord oh my soul for all of my betrayals he will not repay bless the Lord oh my soul through mercy and compassion his great love is true. He covers my transgressions like the snow. As far as he's from west, I roll my sin to remove. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. from 
Merciful and gracious is my God to me. Bless the Lord, O my soul. And I will tell His goodness through eternity. Bless the Lord, O my soul. And bless the Lord, you angels, all you
the whole earth sings. The Redeemer has come, for He dwells in the presence of His people. For He dwells in the presence of His people. For He dwells in the presence of His people. May be seated. Friends, if you're here today and you're a Christian, that means you believe Jesus Christ after your sins and you're living a life now that's pleasing to him because of that, you should be utterly flattered by how our call to worship passage earlier described you just now. Take a look at it again. Peter there called you a precious living stone that God's using to build up his spiritual temple. Now, this refers to the Old Testament uh, when God told the Israelites to build a temple back then, he told them to pick and choose only the most precious and expensive and valuable stones and use those kinds of stones to build up the physical temple in the Old Testament. And Peter here in the New Testament is saying that you are those stones. Every single one of you is a precious brick, is an expensive stone God's using to build up his temple. And we hear this. And we go, me? <laughs> me, a precious living stone? And, and we feel that because we know that, in all honesty, there's a huge discrepancy, isn't there? There's a huge gap between how God just described us here in our call to worship and how we actually are in our day-to-day -day lives. And look, God knows that gap as well. He knows how we all are in our day-to-day -day lives. Look at the first verse of our call to worship today. Peter there says, put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and slander. What does this mean? Well, this means that these so-called precious living stones still struggle with malice and deceit and hypocrisy and envy and slander. Or else, why would Peter tell us to put it away if we don't still struggle with them? God's not naive. He knows what we know. He knows that none of us live up to the way we were just described in this passage today. So as we continue in our time of worship today, I want to invite all of us to read out loud our confession of sin today, taken from Psalm chapter 51, that acknowledges this gap that exists between who God calls us to be and how we actually are in our day-to-day -day lives. Let's read with me our confession of sin, taken from Psalm chapter 51. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. For you will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O oh God, you will not despise. Let's pray. Father, we're not even close to living up to how we're meant to live in Christ. And we realize the huge gap that exists between how you call us to be and who you describe us to be with, who we actually are today. Here now, Father, our silent prayers of confession as we specifically bring up to you the ways in which we have fallen short of your call. Here now, Father, our silent prayers of confession.
Father, you know our sins way better than we do. And you know the gap between us being called a righteous child of God and the sinful habits we have. It's, it's so huge and we don't even know the extent of it. But yet, even then, you gave us your son. Help us now, Father, see him so that we would no longer remain in the mire of our sin, but in the joy of our salvation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So the question is then that we all should be asking is how can God call malicious, deceitful, hypocritical, envious slanderers like every single one of us here, precious stones that's used to build up God's temple? How can Peter in our call to worship acknowledge both our lack of virtue and our precious value all in the same breath? How is that possible? Well, read verse 5 for our call to worship. It tells us, is because someone, Peter said, offered up a sacrificial offering that's acceptable to God on our behalf. Now, when a sacrifice in the Old Testament is, is acceptable to God, when it's a pleasing aroma to God, that means that the one who offered it, who killed the sacrifice, was, was pure, not only in their actions, but also in their motivations, in their heart, in their deed, in their mind. Their whole person was pure in, in the act. So apparently, someone perfect, apparently someone who's never lied or envied or slandered with their tongue nor in their heart, offered up a sacrifice so that sinful people like us can be precious. And who is that person? Well, Peter tells us at the end of verse 5. Who is it? It's Jesus. And what did he sacrifice? Not a lamb, his own body, his own life. How can Peter call envious, malicious slanders like us precious stones because Jesus covered that gap? And friends, the more you understand how the cross fills up that gap, the more you'll fall into worship. So let's do that today as we continue our time of worship. Let's remember how Christ lifted us up above our stations, not because of anything we've done, but purely because of his mercy and grace. Here now, Christian, your shirts are parted, taken from John chapter 10. Jesus' words, he said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me. She says, the Father knows me, and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life, that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I receive. Father, how often we forget the extent of your grace. When we do bad things, we often think that we're too sinful for the cross. What an insult that is to the blood of Christ. When we do good things, how much we forget and feel like we don't need the cross. What an insult that is to the blood of Christ. We are confused creatures. Help us today, Father, really fall into the heart of worship as we see that the good news that we are loved way beyond what we dare to believe, even though we're sinful way beyond what we dare to believe. And in his name alone, we continue in our time of worship and end this prayer. Amen. Friends, we're going to stand to our feet and declare the goodness of God. gift of grace is Jesus my Redeemer. There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold is only Jesus for my life is only bound to his oh how 
how strange and divine I can sing all is mine yet not I but through Christ in me The night is dark but I am not forsaken for by my side the Savior he will stay I labor on in weakness and rejoicing for in my need his power is displayed to this I hold my shepherd Jesus, for he has said that he will bring me home. Our statement of faith today is taken from, um, from Heidelberg Catechism, question and answer 55 and 56. I will read the questions. Please read out loud the answers with me. Question 55. What do you understand by the communion of saints? First, that believers, one and all, as members of all this community, share in Christ and in all his treasures and gifts. Second, 
that each member should consider its duty to use these gifts readily and joyfully for the service and enrichment of the other members. Question 56. What do you believe concerning the forgiveness of sins? I believe that God, because of Christ's satisfaction, will no longer remember any of my sins or my sinful nature, which I need to struggle against all my life. Rather, by grace, God grants me the righteousness of Christ to free me forever from judgment. Amen. Thank you, Vera. And friends, if you're wondering uh, why we at Covenant City Church read these documents, that's not scripture, because we believe these documents are helpful summaries of what scripture teaches and talks about. And it's interesting that uh, the, the people that wrote the Hadabur Catechism decided that uh, communion of saints should go right before uh, another uh, thing about forgiveness of sins. Um, and, and it's just encouraging uh, for us to really study that uh, more and more. All right, okay, so friends, as we continue in time of worship today, uh, we enter into a time of tithes and offering, and as always, I re remind everyone that giving to CCC is the duty and delight for members of Covenant City Church. If you're not a member of Covenant City Church, if you are a member of another local church here somewhere, we don't pressure you to give to us, but we do want to encourage you to continue to give to that local church, whatever it is that you're a member in, um, so that you can help them and continue uh, help to help them in their service of preaching the gospel and making disciples here in the city. Okay, but if you don't want to give to us, there is an offering bag that'll be uh, passed around, or you can give through the QR code that's printed on the back of your liturgies and also on the screen behind me. All right, let's pray, and we'll continue in our time of worship. Father, the act of sacrificial giving uh, should not be separated from the time of worship, which is why we do it in the middle of it and not after or before, because we praise you through these things. We give back to you, um, not because we want to earn more of your love, not because somehow we want to complete whatever the blood of Christ lacked in the forgiveness of our sins. We know it's been fully paid. We know that the one who was rich became poor on the cross for us, Paul says in Romans, so that we may be spiritually rich because of his poverty. And Father, now let us give back uh, and I acknowledge all of our riches um, belong to him and it's to be used for his glory and his name. Thank you, Father. And uh, I pray as we continue this time of worship, you'd be with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So why don't we stand to our feet and learn this new song together try to follow along but if you can't just pay attention to the lyrics and reflect upon it
Let's pray. Father, thank you for um, however it is you've sustained us this past few years as we continue to worship you and preach the gospel, make disciples, and lead others uh, to your kingdom through the news of Christ. And I pray that whatever resources you have given us and continue to give us, you would give us the wisdom and the love for you that would then use these resources to love others in the way that Jesus loved us and to not use these resources instead for our own purposes or our own glory or our own agendas to build up our own little pointless kingdoms here on earth, but instead to build your kingdom up as we serve and care for every single precious stone that you have entrusted to this local church. And I pray, Father, that as we do so, um, we would be able to express and show the love of Christ beyond just what we say, but also by what we do, and especially by how we use our money, the one thing that seems to compete best as God in our hearts. And I pray, Father, that this will be true not only for us, but other churches in the city. And as we pray for other churches in the city, we're reminded of uh, uh, the new church plant that, that was just launched, Gospel Providence Church, uh, who just started meeting two Sundays ago used to be our, our afternoon service here in CCC. Be with them as they worship you right now, today, at the same time we are. May you, may you also build up that community in love and unity, and you may grow them into the maturity of Christ. And for other churches as well, Father, that may not be immediately connected to us, bless them, be with them. May the gospel shine forth uh, through them as well. And Father, uh, we thank you for all the members here, and we also pray uh, for everyone here who is experiencing different seasons of their lives, that you may uh, continue to impress the news in their heart that your commitment to them is not so flaky depending on the life situation they're currently in. Your commitment to them was expressed uh, fully when you sent your son to die on their behalf. And because of that now, give them the strength to know that your love for them is constant no matter the ups and downs of this tumultuous world we're in. Thank you, Father, and uh, we pray that as we enter now uh, into the preaching of your word soon, that you'd be with our hearts and our minds, and that you would uh, impress upon us the truths that mere words from a preacher can't do by the power of your spirit. But before that, Father, we end this intercessory prayer in the way that you've taught your disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory 
forever and ever. Amen. All right, friends, welcome again to CCC. And uh, as we continue this time, I want to invite our children, ages 0 to 12 today. Uh, you, can, you can go to the door on my left and go towards your uh, Sunday school classes. And as the children and the parents do that, those who are still here, if, I want, if you can stand up and uh, take this time to greet each other uh, in the name of the Lord. Okay, good to have you guys uh, again worshiping here uh, together with us. And a few announcements before we continue on, and hopefully when we get to the other announcements, the parents will be back already so we can be informed with everything going on. But first, uh, if you're new here and you want to get connected to us, download the Church Center app, look for Covenant City Church, get registered. You'll see all of our events there, uh, the Church Center app, okay? Uh, and, and you've got all Bible Studies community groups events going on there. So please check that out and join whatever it is fits best with your life uh, season right now. And also, uh, there's a welcome booth when you exit toward the elevators. There's going to be a welcome booth. If you have any more questions about TCC, you can ask the people there anything that you want to know. And also, if you happen to have any extra um, liturgies with you that you're not bringing home or that you, you don't need, if you want to just drop it off at the welcome booth, we're going to try and uh, recycle them as well. Okay? Uh, also, uh, as I prayed on earlier, our Boston Indonesia service that used to meet on the afternoon uh, here in this, in this room has now split and become their own church plant. It's an intentional split, okay? We, we wanted it to be that way. And they, they're worshiping uh, Sunday morning now, uh, today, in Lote Kuningan. So if you know friends or family that want to be a part of that, uh, please direct them to, to that church, okay? Um, they preach the gospel, same liturgy, same extra-joyful preaching, but, but in Indonesian. All right, three announcements before we continue. So recently, we just launched, launched the Covenant City Church WhatsApp community, and that's just to simply make communication faster and quicker, okay? You can't write there, no one can write there, just the admin can write there, and it's just for announcements. So if you want to know more about everything you got going on, and we don't want to burden your leaders to text every single person about one thing that's happening, everybody can just get it right then and there, please join the WhatsApp group. You can scan the QR code that's behind me, and also, I believe, on your liturgies, and you'll be immediately added to that, okay? Number two, don't forget, CCC Fun Day, Okay, uh, it's this coming Thursday, August 17th, from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. Registration's closed, uh, so uh, we're full already. But if you have signed up, you will be added to the WhatsApp, uh, temporary WhatsApp group about announcements for that. And the event for that, start, check-in starts at 8.30. The, the fun day starts at 9, but check-in starts at 8.30. Um, and if you do want to come, I know that some of you want to come just to play ball or just to do one thing, you know, after 12.00. We do want to encourage you to come to the whole thing if you don't mind or if you could. I know this is, you know, not, not for us. We're doing this for you. Uh, but if you could join the whole thing because we have games and stuff planned with the kids from 9 to 12. Uh, and it will be hard for the numbers of people and stuff if, if you don't uh, come to that. Okay? Let me read the paragraph given to me so I'm sure that I've, I've done my job. The team has prepared activities that will help us get to know each other better. So come and join the whole program. But if you can't join the whole program, join the main event that happens from 9 to 12. All right? Okay. All right. Uh, and that'll be at uh, SPA Akamang, as you guys already know. And we're looking forward to that. Okay. Lastly, really important, please keep this in mind. It's my fault not announcing it last week. So hopefully it sticks with us this week. Um, members meeting. Okay. We have three of these a year, three or four of these a year. Our next one is Sunday, August 27th. So the end of this month. Okay. August 27th. Members meeting, this, this is just for people who are members at CCC, who's done the vows with an elder. It's going to start at 12.30, right after service, here in this room, and lunch registrations will be in the bit.ly link uh, above uh, me, or in the QR code there, or you can just also uh, ask someone to forward that to you, and you can sign up and stuff. So you can have lunch out here, uh, and then after that, come back, join here for the, uh, for the members meeting. It's really important, guys, if you want to truly make this church feel like every precious stone has you know, participation in it. 
you got it. These are the things we got to be a part of these membership meetings. Okay, so please sign up and come to them, and uh, we'll uh, we'll talk about the church then. Okay, all right, let's pray, and then we'll jump into our uh, sermon for the day. Pray with me. Father, build up your church as I try my best to expound the truths you have written here in the book of Ephesians as we go through this series. And I pray that, Father, as we do so, that you will really uh, place whatever effect it is this passage is meant to place in in your people's hearts um, so that we can truly become what Paul says we are to become under the gospel. In Jesus' name, we beg you. Amen. Okay, so, friends, we are continuing today in our series through the book of Ephesians, and we started a few weeks ago, a few months ago in chapter 1, and we're currently at the end of chapter 4. And for the past two and a half chapters or so, what we've seen the Apostle Paul emphasize quite repetitively, right, over and over again, is one particular theme, and if you've been with us the past few weeks, you know what this theme is. It's the theme of unity, gospel unity, right? That's what's been written. That's what Paul's been talking about. That's what Paul's been explaining why a local church should be like that. But what Paul hasn't been talking about as much is the how. Okay, he's talking about what it is. He's talking about why we should be it. He hasn't talked about the how. And that's exactly what he gets to in our passage today. What are the practical things can members of a local church actually do for and to one another in order to fast foster family unity, okay? And if I'm honest, ever since this part of the series, I've been, I've been a pastor for seven years, right? And I've counseled many of you. And I know, therefore, that for many of us, the deepest wounds in our lives were caused by family. The deepest hurts we've experienced was from our old communities and friend groups. And some of us here have experienced some of that hurt here in CCC in your current gospel family. And this is why I told the staff team two weeks ago, throughout this part of the book, I've been feeling a bit like a fake salesman up, up here. <laughs> you know, I'm up here saying, family, but you're all going, ah, family, you know? <laughs> we know the wounds and the pains caused by the communities and families are represented here by every single one of you. But here's why we push on. Here's what I think is interesting. Isn't it interesting that even after all the hurt you've experienced, after all the ways your family members and your old communities and friends have failed you, for some reason, we just keep persisting to search on for this elusive version of a perfect family either by constantly fixing the one we're currently in or by looking for better ones in the future, whatever it is, we seek for it even now, even after you've been hurt so many times, that kapok kapok, you know, which is Indonesian for you just, you keep going, even though you're beat down so much. And it's like, why? <laughs> why, why keep going even after being hurt so many times? You, you just have to find it. Why this unsatiable longing for something so elusive? There's a quote from an old movie I like that I thought was pretty interesting. It says this. It's like we all feel homesick for a place that doesn't even exist. You know? You create a new idea of family for yourself, for your kids, for the family you start. And it's like a cycle or something. Then the movie goes on and says, but maybe that's all family really is. A group of people that miss the same imaginary place. And what the Bible would say is, yes, we do miss it, but not because it's an imaginary place. It's a real place. We've been trying to get back to that place since Genesis chapter 3. And one day, God will take us there when he completes the story. But the good news is, we can also taste a bit of it now, here in our local church. Big promise? Well, let's take a look at how. 
Let's read God's instructions through the Apostle Paul, taken from Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17 to 5, verse 2. This is how. This is the word of God. Now I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, due to the hardness of their heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity, but that is not the way you learn Christ. Assuming that you've heard about him and were taught in him as a truth in, is in Jesus, to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through de de deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, having put away all falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but, let, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such, is, such as is good for building up as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom we were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. <coughs> Thus says the Lord. Family is not an imaginary place, and believe it or not, your local church has the potential to be an appetizer for it, but if you want your church to be that, then every single member in your local church, not just the elders and the pastors, not just the deacons, not just the staff, not just the community group leader and Bible leaders, every single member must have, first, a mind that's not alienated from God, second, a will that's resolved on wearing the new self, and third, a pure sincerity for God and others, okay? Let's break those down. Let's go to our first point. We must have a mind that's not alienated from God. Okay, so Paul starts off his instructions here about how to become family by first explaining how the people in a Christian community must walk differently than the Gentiles do. That's verse 17. Okay, what are the Gentiles? That's just a phrase that refers to non-Christians. Okay, if you want to foster true unity, you've got to walk differently than non-Christians do. And then... He kind of goes on to describe non-Christians, I think in a way that at face value sounds a bit unfair, right? He's a bit harsh. Look at that, verses 17 to 19. He describes the Gentiles and the non-Christians as having futility of mind. They've been darkened in their understanding. They're alienated from the life of God. They're ignorant. They're callous. They've given up to sensuality, greedy, and every practice of every kind of impurity. And it's like, man, Paul, that's, that's a bit harsh, isn't it? You know, you're making them out to sound like monsters. I actually know a lot of non-Christians who are, in fact, much more kind and forgiving and patient and selfless than I am or than many other Christians that I know, which is true. I, I know many of those as well. So how do you make sense of Paul's words here? Well, what Paul's trying to say is not that non-Christians completely lack virtue whatsoever or have no sense of God at all. No, no. To really get what Paul's saying here, we actually got to go to Romans chapter 1, verse 21, okay, where he repeats the same exact phrasing to describe the non-Christians that he did in Ephesians chapter 4 just now, okay? Let me read it to you, and I think it's on the screen behind me as well, just for clarity. Tell me if you hear the similarity. This is what Paul said in Romans chapter 1. Uh, verse 21. He said, For although they knew God, talking about the Gentiles, non Christians, although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they become, here it is, futile in their thinking, right? That's what Paul said in 417, Ephesians 417 just now, the Gentiles have futility of mind, they're futile in their thinking, 
And he continues in Romans chapter 1, their foolish hearts were darkened. Do you see that? Same with Ephesians chapter 4. Paul says they're, they have darkened understandings. Okay, so Romans chapter 1 and Ephesians chapter 4 is Paul's description of the non-Christian. But look at this. Did you notice what Paul said here in the beginning of Romans 1.21? He didn't say these people have no sense of God at all, so they become futile in their thinking and darkened in their understanding. It's not what he said. What did he say? He said, though they knew God. Well, isn't that interesting? How can they know God? Though they know God, but they did not honor him as God. That's why they become futile in their thinking and dark understanding. So if we let Paul's words in Romans 121 inform Paul's words in our passage today, Ephesians 4, 17 to 18, okay, following, it can't mean that he's saying non-Christians don't have any sense of the divine or any traits of virtue at all. What he's saying is that though they know God, although they have a sense of godness and virtue, yet they don't give honor to God as a source and standard for these virtues. Let me try to explain it this way. Stick with me. If you, for example, you're here today and you don't believe in the existence of God, right? You don't believe in the existence of a personal moral being that exists above, before, and beyond creation who is the source and standard for all that is virtuous. Well, the question that you're faced with, therefore, is where do you source this source and standard for virtue from then? Where does that come from? Who decides the benchmark? Well, you might respond, I do, Tez. Look, I don't need to believe in a God to be a loving person, to be a selfless person, to be a patient human being. I can source those virtues from within myself. Okay. Or you might say, my parents are. M my parents, the way they raised me, the values and habits they planted in me, that's the source and standard of virtue. Okay. Or you might say, my culture is, right? The Indonesian culture, Chinese culture, American culture, whatever. That's the source and standard for virtue, okay? But if that's the case, there's an issue that I want to propose you end up running into each time. Stick with me. If you say earlier, you know, I'm the source and standard for virtue, my preferences, my norms, my emotions, my common sense, do you see how that's problematic? That statement requires a very high level of self-grandeur. You're saying that your emotions and your common sense is the source and standard for virtue? And what if you extend that logic to everyone else? How does that work? Whose definition is right? Every, every person is the ultimate norm. Okay, you say, well, my family is that. My family is, you know, their family, my family values is the unquestionable standard and norm for virtue. But, you know, I have to say, to say that a group of people are the unquestionable source of standard for virtue, that is dangerously close to how cults begin. I for sure don't want my kids to view me as a source and standard for virtue. I'm way too sinful for that. We all are. Okay, if you say my culture is then, you know, the Indonesian culture, Chinese culture, American culture, that's the standard for, you know, virtue. Is that not racism? <laughs> it doesn't work. You know, anytime you don't honor God as a source and standard for virtue and replace him with something else here on earth, as a source and center for virtue. One, it breeds all kinds of dangerous implications. Two, it's utterly chaotic. Because now, there's no potential for anyone to be on the same page. Like, how much forgiveness is enough forgiveness? How, how, how sacrificial should I be in this particular situation? How does love express itself in this unique scenario? How far must I take integrity with me in this specific case? Who decides? Do I decide? Does he decide? Does her family decide? Does his culture decide? Is it a meeting point of, or a secret combination of all that? Like, what is the source and standard? No one's on the same page, you see. That's why Paul says in verse 17 to 18, they've, because of their alienation from God, they become futile in their thinking, their foolish hearts were darkened, and they become ignorant. 
not because they don't have virtue, but because they don't have a standard for virtue. No one's on the same page. And that unclarity not only breeds disunity, but some have even used it as an excuse to justify their sensuality, greediness, and impurity. Paul continues in verse 19. You see? No anchor. But you, Christian, he says in verse 20, you, that is not the way you've learned Christ. You shouldn't be confused. You have an anchor. You have a source and standard for virtue. Who is it? Jesus Christ, who is God, who's come down to us, the Bible claims. You have an anchor. You have a pinpoint. But before you go, ah, Jesus, do you realize how high of a standard that is for you, Christian? Think about it. If Jesus is your source and standard for virtue, for integrity, for love, for truthfulness, for selflessness, for patience, that is not a call to relax at all. It's actually the exact opposite. It's a call for us all to start rolling up our sleeves and do some work, some hard work. It's a call, Paul says in verse 20, 21, to put off our old self and put on our new self, which leads us to our second point. In order for a local church community to, to feel truly one, Every member must have a mind that's not alienated from God. We have to have the same source and standard, okay, or else it's chaos. Or two, and two, we have to have a will that's resolved on wearing the new self. All right, let's move on to the passage. Paul says, because our source and standard for virtue is Christ, his life, his character, then obviously there are tons of characteristics about our own lives that we need to take off and leave behind and replace with Jesus' characteristics. But there's no way Paul can tackle every single one of them. So he focuses here in verses 25 to 32 in our passage on four specific things for us to put off and put on. Let's call it four different adornments. Okay, when you adorn yourself with something that every member of a church must be committed to doing if you really want to show the world that family is not an imaginary place. Okay, let's talk about the first one. And these, these adornments in that passage, by the way, is broken down by the word let at the beginning of each one, okay? The first adornment, it's in the middle of verse 25. Paul says, let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Okay, that's the first adornment process. Paul tells us to put on what? Truthfulness right? Speak truthfully, speak accurately about your neighbor to your neighbor. You can vent, just be mindful of how it can so easily turn into gossip, all right? And what are we supposed to put off then? Interestingly, Paul doesn't say put off untruthfulness, because that's the opposite of truthfulness, right? Untruthfulness, lies. He doesn't. He says put off sinning in your anger. Now, what does that mean? Paul here is actually quoting Psalm chapter 4, Verse 4, where the psalmist there says the same thing, be angry and do not sin. And it's actually in the context of self-regulation, okay? Paul's saying, the psalmist is saying, if you don't deal with your anger towards someone else, if you, if you let the sun go down on it, right, if you allow it to fester on, you know what you're doing? You're giving the devil an opportunity, he says in verse 27. To do what? What does he do? He doesn't immediately blow up the situation. No, 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 no. That's going to force you to deal with the resentment. He wants many sons to go down in your resentment. You know what he does? Verse 25. He uses that festering resentment to tempt you to ever so slightly describe the person you're angry at inaccurately, just a bit untruthfully. Think about a person you have resentment currently towards now. And if you're honest, do you not find it unbelievably hard to paint that person purely objectively and accurately as you vent about him or her to someone else? Isn't it so hard to do? Now, none of us here would straight up lie about the person, 
right? Most of us would just edit a good 5 to 15% of the story so that we can still satisfy our resentment, but yet be protected from liability in the future. You know what I'm talking about? I see a lot of you smiling, because I know you know, because we all struggle with it, okay? Don't do that. You accumulate those kind of conversations over a few years in a church. You know what happens? Not family, I'll tell you that much. Put off resentment, put off this long-lasting anger, put on truthfulness when you speak about others. Side note, if you find that willpower alone isn't sufficient to soothe your resentment, you know a really good option. It's to talk to the person directly about it. And trust me, I hate conflict. I have exhausted many options <laughs> that's available to me. And I will tell you now with confidence, there is no better way than honest and true, direct conversation with that person. Go do it. Put off resentment, put on truthfulness. Two, second adornment, verse 28. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Put off, put off what, Paul says here? Put off selfish stealing, okay? Now, I do want to point out here that the word steal here, in the, or in the Greek, kleptas, it doesn't actually refer to the act of explicit stealing, like when you snatch someone's purse, you know, and run away. It's not that kind of theft. The kind of theft here is referring to the kind of thievery that happens in secret, that happens silently, okay? So Paul here is most likely referring to someone in, a com in the community who's actually not in need, but yet they present themselves as being in need, fooling everyone else in the community so that everyone else will give to him or her. Paul's saying that's, that's not being needy. That's being greedy. That's called theft. Now, He's not saying that everyone who's in need is lying, okay? Look at verse 28. He says those who silently steal should labor, go get a job. Why? So that they can share with anyone who actually is in need. So there is a category of people who truly are actually in need, and if that's the case, the church should generously give to this person, as Christ did for us. But, Paul's saying, if you actually could get a job, and you're just too lazy to, and everyone else ends up carrying your weight for you. That's not neediness. That's selfishness. Take off selfishness. Work. Get a job. Labor. Why? So that you can put on sacrificial giving to those who are actually in need. Okay. First, take off resentment. Put on truthfulness. Second, Take off selfishness, put on sacrificial giving. Third adornment, verse 29. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion. Okay. Take off what? Corrupting speech. Now, what is corrupting speech? Obviously, it's speech that's unnecessarily crude or filthy, you know? But even non-crude and filthy words, Paul says here, can corrupt. If they're not spoken at the appropriate moment. That's what he said, right? Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such is good for building up as fits the occasion. So for example, if someone who's married for a long time to an objectively difficult spouse, and this person is in tears in front of me after 10, 20 sessions, and this person is telling me, Tez, I've tried everything I have tried everything, but it's been really, really brutal recently, and he's crying, and then I go, man up, you little softy. <laughs> okay, you know, is that an appropriate <laughs> words at the right time? I don't think so. That's not good, but does that therefore mean I can never say those words? For example, in the other hand, if a newlywed who's been married for like two months and he's married to an objectively great spouse, 
but he's just a little whiny because he's not used to giving up some of the privileges he had while he was single, and, you know, and he's just kind of, life's so hard. Then, on that occasion, I might go, hey, you know, man up. You can do, you can do hard things. I probably wouldn't say a little softy, but that's, that's just <laughs> inappropriate at all times, okay? It seems like. But you see what I'm saying? What's the appropriate moment? Do you have that wisdom? Can you tell what's when you need to? Okay, take off resentment, put on truthfulness, take off selfishness, put on sacrificial giving, and third, we just talked about earlier, take off crude insensitivity and put on graceful speech that builds up. Okay, and build up there is referring to the whole body of Christ. Fourth, last one, last adornment, verse 31. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Now, this one might sound similar to the first one, to the first adornment about resentment, but it's a little different. Paul here is actually not referring to the inaccurate speech and gossips that resentment might induce. He's talking about here the direct malicious words that anger might make us directly say to a person right then and there, okay? In other words, you could say verbal abuse. Now, this can take many forms, explosive words to the person, obviously, or subtle jabs marked by, masked by humor, or sarcastic comments that's actually loaded with angry energy. Take that off, Paul says. Instead, be kind. Can I just say this? Kindness, I think, is the most underrated and often mocked virtue. Stop mocking it. Be kind, tenderhearted, forgive one another as Christ has forgiven you. By the way, as I talk about these lack of virtues, I, I end up making eye contact with some of you. That's not personal. Okay, I'm not like <laughs> directing <laughs> these things I notice when I look at Evan. I'm like, oh, I'm not. Okay, <laughs> that would be an inappropriate moment to, to do that. Okay, so let's summarize. You want a gospel family. You want the world to look at your local church and see that family is not just an imaginary place. One, take off resentment and be truthful when you speak about your neighbor. Take off selfishness and start giving to your neighbor. Take off crude insensitivity and speak in a way that builds your neighbor up. And lastly, take off verbal abuse and be patient toward your neighbor. All right? So if we just do all those things, we'll finally be family, and the world will be convinced that a real family exists. Right? Okay, let's pray, and let's see immediate results by tomorrow. Now, we all know it's not that simple. Okay, why? Because, look, church folk, right, us all, we generally do these things already, kind of, don't we? I mean, we give our money away every Sunday. We tithe. Many churches have mercy ministry programs. We say nice words. We do sacrificial things. We're generally kind people. So then, if we're doing these things, why does the church still, for some reason, feel disjointed? It just feels a bit off still. You know, everyone's being nice, everyone's being kind, but why does there still feel like there's this gap between how clean we look on the outside and what we actually are in reality? Where's that gap come from? Well, Paul addresses this in the last section of the passage. To be truly family, every member must have a mind that's not alienated from God, a will that's resolved on wearing the new self, and lastly, a pure sincerity for God and others. Where do we see that in the passage? In chapter 5, verse 1 and 2, the last verse there, the last two verses in your passage. So after Paul tells us all these things that we've got to do, he says, Therefore, the imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Now, do you remember what that phrase means, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God? We talked about it briefly in our call to worship earlier. It's a phrase that refers to the purity 
of one's inside motivation as they offer these sacrifices to God. Remember in the Old Testament, if a person kills an animal and offers it as an, as an aroma to God, it won't be pleasing to God if they're doing it with the wrong motives. The person's offering won't, wouldn't be received as a fragrant aroma if, the, if it's uh, done not with pure intentions, but for self-serving purposes. So what Paul is reminding the Christian here, what he's reminding all of us here at the last part of this passage, that when Jesus died for you, he said, his sacrifice was a fragrant aroma. It was a fragrant pleasing to God. Why? Because, Paul's trying to say, that Jesus there didn't only do the right actions. He also did it with pure motives. Therefore, imitate this, church. It's not enough for you to just do the right external acts. It's not enough for you to just tithe or sacrificially give or be patient or speak graciously or act kindly. You got to do it truly, holistically, fully, inside and out. Look, here's the problem. It's not that the church isn't smiling enough, but it's that those smiles are rarely real. You see, you tell me how many smiles has betrayed you in your life. You tell me how many acts of kindness have been offered to you with ulterior motives. Tell me how many people who said they forgave you end up quietly slipping out of your life. Hmm? How many times has believing in kind words end up biting you in the back? Even Jesus was killed by a kiss. The problem isn't that we're not smiling at each other enough, but it's that we're frowning on the inside. If you want your truthful speech, your sacrificial giving, your gracious speeches, your kindness and your patience and your forgiveness to actually ascend into heaven and become a pleasing aroma to God, you got to do it because you actually want to love the person you're doing it too. And look, I'll be the first to say that I struggle with this more than perhaps many people here. You think I'm nice? I'm not nice. I hate conflict. That's why you rarely see me mad. Just being honest. It's not because I'm actually that nice. It's not because I feel this deep internal commitment to love the other. It's because I'm committed to escape the discomfort of relational tension <laughs> with everything I have. That's why I'm so nice. You think I'm patient? I'm not that patient. You know what I am? I'm a people pleaser. I want you to like me so much, I end up looking meek and patient, but really, I just can't stand you having a problem with me. But deep inside, patience is actually the last thing I feel. And love in those moments is not even in the periphery of my heart. Just being honest. See, now you're all like, does he actually like me? <laughs> you know, like, does he, has, has it been a lie this whole time? No, okay, like, I do love you, and I do like you. But this is what this does, right? It, it creates this suspicion between each other. We just don't know. Is it real? And I promise I'm working on making my insides to align with my outsides, you know? But don't you see, this is our problem. It's not that we don't smile enough. It's that we're not really smiling, But when Jesus died on the cross, it was a fragrant offering to God. Listen, what you saw him do for you on the outside was exactly what he felt for you on the inside. You believe that? There's no gap. There's no discrepancy. You don't need to be suspicious of that. Not a single lie. He loved you. Really, truly, so he gave himself up for you. So Paul said. Now, I'm also not saying that you can only smile at someone on the outside when you really feel like smiling on the inside, okay? Don't do that. Good luck with that. 
all right? Here's what I'm saying. Church, as you adorn yourselves with these things Paul's telling you to do, just beware of your heart. Beware of your motives. Have I really forgiven this person, or am I just saying it's okay to simply brush the tension away? Am I, am I giving because I really do love this person or because I can't handle the icky feeling of guilt if I don't? Am I kindly conversing with this person because I actually care about their lives or because that's just what we're supposed to do after church for like 20 minutes? Am I actually being virtuous, truly, for the sake of God and neighbor or am I, do it, am I doing it to hide what's truly in my heart? Jesus didn't die for you to cover up what was truly in his heart. That was his heart. So you, Christian, do likewise to your neighbor. Let's pray. Father, it's utterly discouraging at times to know that we have a source and standard beyond this world who is Christ. Because how in the world do we live up to that? We can't even do it externally, and now you're asking us to do it internally? And I pray that, Father, as we attempt to put on these adornments in our lives, that you remind us also of the gospel, of the good news that Jesus Christ did not die for us because we're virtuous, Jesus Christ did not die for us because we're forgiving, because we're patient, because we speak accurately about everyone all the time, because our heart motivations are always pure. Jesus Christ died for us because he really did love us. Inside out. He didn't need us. He was worshiping and glorifying the Father just fine without us in eternity past. He wanted us for the Father's glory. Father, help us as a church adorn ourselves with these virtues, and may we, if by any stretch of your mercy and grace, may we be some kind of flavor to this world about what family is, and help us show them it's not an imaginary place we keep looking for. It's here. Come. They can join through Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Brothers and sisters, let us stand to our feet and sing this last song together. I believe in Christ, risen from the dead. He now reigns victorious, his kingdom knows no end. Through his resurrection, death has lost its hold. I know on that final day I'll rise as Jesus rose. On that day, we will see you shining brighter than the sun on that day. We will know you as we lift our voice as one. Till that day, we will praise you for your never-ending grace. And we will keep on singing on that glorious day. Keep on singing on that glory.
Friends, the day will come where we will actually feel and know and reach and experience true family. It's not yet now, but it will. But until then, the encouragement of God's word today is for all of us to adorn ourselves with these things so that as best as we can, we can give those who don't yet know Christ and give ourselves an appetizer of that joy. Let's do that for our sake and for the glory of our King. Receive now, friends, your benediction. Lord, bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Now go in his peace. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above me, heavenly host. Praise Father, Son.